So good evening, everyone. I uh, appreciate you coming to join us on our next VFS webinar. Uh, this is a joint uh, effort between the Redstone chapter and uh, Arizona chapter and Philadelphia chapter. My name is Ed Martin, and I'm the program chair for the Redstone chapter. And so uh, this is the presentation that we've planned for today. Uh, but quickly, I wanted to give an update for things that are going to be coming on uh, soon uh, for all the other chapters and as well as ourselves. Uh, so for the Redstone chapter, uh, we're aiming towards uh, August, having a future particle lift uh, cross-functional team roadmap update. And then uh, in February of next year, we're shooting to having a complex systems uh, technical meeting. Hopefully that will be an in-person meeting uh, here in Huntsville. Um, and more information with that will be forthcoming. Uh, we're also planning on the call for papers coming out with the next month or two. For the uh, Arizona chapter, um, Colton was not able to sign on to this evening, uh, so I'll mention that uh, for June, we're working with uh, Susan Gorton out of NASA Langley uh, to have an update on their uh, Mars helicopter uh, program. She's gonna talk over the aeromechanics uh, efforts that the, uh, NASA Langley uh, supported for JPL and getting that helicopter together and hopefully some uh, first flight videos and uh, will be available at that time. And then for uh, the Philadelphia chapter, I wanted to mention uh, at the end of this month, uh, they'll be doing their uh, dr uh, drive, dry uh, run-throughs of their VFS presentations. Uh, that's being offered uh, to the local chapter membership. And so if you're from the Philadelphia chapter and you have a presentation at VFS coming up, uh, please look for that in, in, uh, invite. So we'll go on to the program uh, that we have planned for this evening. Uh, our speaker is uh, Mark Ratliff. He's from uh, the uh, DEVCOM uh, Aviation and uh, Missile uh, Center Readiness Center in Huntsville, Alabama. He's from the Systems Readiness Directorate and is the Rapid Response Integration Manager. And he's going to be talking to us today on the uh, advanced manufacturing policy out of AMCOM. So I'll, over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, appreciate the introduction. As I said, my name is Mark Ratliff. Um, it's a, my title is a very fancy title for a brilliant airworthiness advisor to our prototype integration facility. Um, the Systems Readiness Director, for those of you who don't know, is responsible for the airworthiness of all Army aviation, except for a, a very few um, aircraft that are very specialized. So, you know, we, we maintain the fielding readiness for all of the Apaches, the CH-47s, and the SIG. And the, the policy they'll be bringing forward to you is actually an AMCOM policy. Uh, it's very important for us because we know that advanced manufacturing holds a lot of capability for the future warfighter and for future vertical lift, not to, not to mention that as well. <clears throat> so. As for myself, I've been around the block a little bit. Um, I start off as a structures guy with, within Systems Readiness Directorate. First, be beforehand, it was AED. Uh, I was an airframe guy in the platform office on Apache. I did some time as a foreign military sales guy in Apache. Spent some time as a tech lead on the H6I from the PM side. And then I got into this assignment that I'm in now, and I've been here about a year and a half now. So <clears throat> I've had a, a wealth of knowledge, everything from a functional engineer to a platform engineer to managing a, a platform for the PM. So I brought all of that whenever I assisted the major general in my leadership with this policy that I'm about to bring to you. So next slide. So the topics we're gonna cover today are what it is, why it's needed, what it does, how we came up with the policy itself, and then the vision where we expect it to go. And then we'll follow up with a few questions that you guys have, so don't hold back. It'll be taking them in the chat for you, and we'll talk about them at the end. And then I have my contact info at the end in case you guys have any questions, follow-on information, or anything of that nature. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, what is the advanced manufacturing policy? In short, it is the policy that Major General Royer asked us to construct because he ended up going to a site visit and seeing some things that made him a little bit uncomfortable. As most of us know, additive manufacturing, specifically 3D printers, are, are readily available by anybody, relatively inexpensive. Our Army maintainers and warfighters are super smart and they're super ingenuitive when it comes to, hey, I need something, I want it now, how am I gonna create it? So a lot of these guys were actually going out on their own 
and procuring 3D printers. So he came back to us. He asked us to assist him in writing a policy that would speak to the aviation enterprise. And that's everybody. That's um, the PEO, Program Management Office. It's Defense Logistics Agency. It's everybody, all the way down to the unit. Uh, he was very careful about making sure that the right team was put together to construct it and that we covered everything. So not just his chain of command, but also informing everybody in the aviation enterprise how to go about getting an advanced manufactured part approved the correct way. That way that you had your airworthiness covered and you had all of the logistics and sustainment things covered that you wanted to for those other stakeholders like the PMs and the logistics. So it was really, it, it started off kind of a, kind of as a white informational paper, white paper, and then all of a sudden it turned into a policy and here we are today. Um, we already have revision one out. Very soon we'll be working on revision two. And uh, you know, it's, it's constantly, constantly being revised and looked at for improvement. So that's really what it does from an overarching aspect. From my personal experience as a field support guy, the key thing for us is it gives the aviation units a particular POC that they can reach out to at AMCOM and at our organization, System Drainage Directorate, in case they have any questions for a advanced manufacturing or out of manufacturing component. How can I get this done? I have this idea. Who do I talk to? right there in black and white for these guys so they can go out and gives them a direct line to get that accomplished, which to me is a huge benefit for those guys in the field. Because a lot of them don't know how to do it. They don't know how to get those good ideas that are in their brains done appropriately. And so this provides them that clear path and that clear direction to get them where they need to go. Next slide, please. So why is it needed? We already talked a little bit about how our units and how our guys are so smart and they're looking for quick quick repairs or things that can just make their jobs easier. Any type of tool, a, a fixture, a, um, a jig, anything that can help them with drilling or cutting or, or test fitting. So these guys were out there trying their best to come up with a quick solution to that while not being wasteful. And that's how they ended up getting some of these 3D printers and going off on their own and doing some stuff. So, Again, this gives them that direct line on how to accomplish it the correct way with the correct airworthy oversight from our organization and given us the capability to get the PMs involved as we see fit. But also beyond that, when you're talking about one unit having this capability, we have now uh, have an IPT that we work with that has a conglomeration of folks that we can take these tools and spread them across the units worldwide if it's something that's super useful right so um, one thing that we're trying to get out in the known if you see here on this presentation is a bathtub fitting check so they take a bathtub fitting this is a 47 you know and instead of trying to make one fit it it's wrong make one fit it's wrong they 3d printed one and then they can 3d print one cheaper quicker they can test fit it make the minor adjustments get it the way they want to and then they take that and then they go off and they make their finalized component out of a metallic, out of the forging or any other traditional process that they have for doing that. And so it's saving them time, it's saving them money, <clears throat> it's making them way more efficient at their jobs. And so by getting it out in the community that, hey, these non-flyable prototypes, this is a great way for you guys to do it. it it's, it's really going to be make a great effort to make their life easy, right? Um, over here you have an engine bolt tool. It's just a guide bolt. It's so nuanced, it's not even funny, but we still have to ensure that the correct oversight is provided because let's say this tool actually interfaced with the uh, engine in a different manner than just holding bolts. Well, that could cause an airworthiness concern from our perspective. So this provides them a way to get the oversight and still accomplish their mission while still getting their job done and still getting the tools they want in a quick manner. Next slide, please. So what it does, as I already kind of stated above, you know, the, the direct line POCs are, are the main thing to this. It gives those guys a, a clear path on how to get something qualified. Well, not qualified, but approved for use, if you will, 
from an additive manufacturing and advanced manufacturing standpoint. Uh, you know, it's it's important to remember that additive manufacturing is just a component of advanced manufacturing, right? So there's lots of different advanced manufacturing techniques for cold sprays, um, laser bed powder fusion, which I had a great video for, but Chris messed it up. It was the greatest video. It would have been fantastic. You would have loved it. But, yeah, uh, you know, there's a lot of different techniques for advanced manufacturing. The emphasis initially has been on additive because the guys have access to those printers. There's one in the field kit for the TACOM guys, the ground units. And so those guys have it right across the street from where the aviation units are most of the time. Another thing it does is in this policy, we categorize the components. <clears throat> now, the categorization is of utmost importance because it helps clearly define the difference between a CSI or safety component and a non-flyable prototype where no harm, no foul, it's not going in the air, it's just assisting guys. So we clearly lay out those different categories and we don't give necessarily all of the qualification requirements or the data we'll need, but what we do give is a shopping list is what one of our um, leads associated with us, Jay Lambert used to call it, and it's a great example, it's a great statement for it because it gives you a list of things we might ask for depending on what it is. Um, you know, how we categorize it, I'm going to get into a little bit later, but it's highly dependent on the Famica. And it's not going to be a one size fits all for a category, right? So category six are CSIs and safety components, but it's not always going to be, well, it's category six, so I need an A base allowable or B base allowable. It's going to be dependent on what the failure mechanism or the consequence of failure, more importantly, is of that component. But we'll talk about that here in the, the next slide or two. Now, <clears throat> this right here gives you a couple of things that we've done in the past. Um, if you look on the right, this is a shroud that basically keeps shells from falling into a place where we don't want it. So the guys were having a problem getting a hold of this component. They used to go out and buy a plumbing fitting from Home Depot or Lowe's and would mount it in there, right? Special ops guys, very special. So what they ended up doing was creating a model and actually 3D printing this component and getting it put on wing down at CCAT. It actually flew it's flying now on some On the left is an environmental seal on a 64 tailwheel landing gear. So it's just an environmental closeout. Um, I don't know. We have it did get authorized to fly. I don't know if it ever got pushed to an aircraft to actually fly itself because I think they got a hold of the part. But this just goes to show you some of the places where we can insert additive manufacturing and get a better result than what the guys were doing before. Would I rather have control of a part that they're actually printing, that we've reviewed, seen the model, and actually have given our airworthiness the stamp on, or would I rather have them going down to Home Depot and buying a drain cover? I think we can all agree that the best approach would be to get your airworthiness engineers involved and to have a good oversight and a good process to find, which is what the, the policy really does. Um, next slide, please. Method of construction. So as you can see here, we actually have it defined into seven categories. Um, and this was new in the latest revision. Previ prior to this, it was six categories. And what we did is we broke out category zero into shop aids and non-flyable prototypes. Uh, and the reason we did that is because you know, shop aids, non-flyable prototypes, we want to provide that engineering oversight just to make sure, as I said before, we're not interfacing with a safety-related component in an improper way. You know, I don't want to be shoving a additive printed borescope tube into an engine unless I make sure that I'm not going to ding anything up and I'm not going to incidentally fall it out the engine by shoving the tube in there. So we actually increased it to seven categories, and these seven categories are not written in stone. Um, you know, they could go back down to six. They could expand out to eight. But what you'll see is they have a increasing color. Sorry about that, got muted. You'll see increasing colors as the categories go up. As I said, category six is our critical safety items and safety impact. So, that is flight critical components like a strap pack on an Apache, but it's also anything that could be a safety impact like a mass retention item in the cockpit, a hand controller mount or a uh, your M4 mount that's in the cockpit. 
So those are all considered safety impacts. All, you know, those are going to be, have a higher level of scrutiny than your non-flyable prototype because it's really just going to be sitting there using it to make sure I get the correct fitment. So you'll see that we have those prototypes, fixtures and jigs and aviation ground support equipment as a lower level of scrutiny. They're green. Should be relatively easy. You know, we're looking for some very significant um, interactions between things, critical safety items, stuff like that. How does it touch those? The yellow items, which are the operational readiness impact, but no safety impact categories, they fly. Category three and four, they are going to be on the aircraft, but the consequence of failure isn't going to be anything catastrophic. Nobody's going to get hurt. It's not going to jam anything. It's not going to cause the malfunction of any weapon system, anything of that nature. And of course, five and six is where we get into things that could affect the either the flight safety or the operations of the aircraft. Now, they may not be able to complete their mission if they don't have this thing working for them. So that's where I said earlier, it's highly dependent on the Famiga. So one of my favorite examples of how this all plays together is an antenna mount, right? I can absolutely create an antenna mount. I can put it on the bottom of the aircraft. I can 3D print it, and it should be very easy to call. If it go, if it comes detached, it's going to go down. It's going to fall down. It's probably not even detached from the aircraft because the cables, in most cases, are strong enough to actually hold on the antennas. Now I take that same antenna mount. Now I put it up on the roof of the aircraft right below the main rotor blades or right in front of the tail rotor blade. Now I'm going to recategorize it because now the consequence of failure is something that could be catastrophic. I don't want it to detach and go up into the rotor blades. I don't want it to come detached and still attach to the cable and go on the rotor blades. Those all bad things that we do not want to happen. So the Famica plays into the same antenna mount same antenna, two different locations, but that categorization is going to be totally different because of the consequence of failure of that antenna. Mount. And the scrutiny associated with it will be relevant to that categorization. So it's not a one size fits all, like I said before. It's also not going to be, you know, one size fits all for that antenna mount itself. It's on the bottom of the aircraft, I may need S base levels. Now, if on the top of the aircraft, man, I want to make sure things strong, maybe I will need A base levels. Who knows? It'll be up to our smart guys and our functional divisions to assist us with defining what those requirements are dependent on that Famica and what it is. So another thing to keep in mind as we came to this method of construction and how we came up with this, we teamed with the whole Army Aviation Enterprise, AMCOM, logistics guys, program management office. We went and spoke with our sister organizations responsible for airworthiness at the FAA at Navy, at the Air Force. Um, this thing had a lot of industry, GE. Um, this thing had a lot of oversight and a lot of visibility from a lot of different organizations. And that was on purpose. Major General Royer didn't want us to miss anything. He wanted to make sure we were covering all of our base. You know, Army aviation and advanced manufacturing, this is still very new for us. Um, it's still in its infancy as far as us getting it qualified and understanding the processes we need to go through to get it qualified. So we sent this thing out and it was very much like herding cats. Everybody had an opinion, which is great, right? Lots of ideas. And so we took all those ideas and we put them into the appropriate bins and we made sure we adjudicate them properly. And everybody pretty much got had a voice. And so that was, it was awesome because now we have this policy that everybody has had a piece and a voice in and it's very very useful and it's only getting better right the uh we were constantly constantly updating the thing we had a workshop last may with industry and with um, some other organizations that came in we're having another one next month so it's it's getting a lot of oversight which is awesome because it's given us a lot of ideas and a lot of thought processes that we're not usually used to so it's and it was definitely a huge team collaboration for Army Aviation as a whole, not just Airworthy, not just AMC. Next slide, please. So vision. <clears throat> so said multiple times, this thing's being revised all the time. It's a living document. Um, at the inception, Major General Royer said specifically, I don't care if I have to update it once a month. We're going to do this. We're going to do it right. We're going to make sure that we have our process the way it needs to be to ensure the safety and 
airworthiness of all Army aviation when they use these. Okay. So it's constantly being revised, constantly having conversations about how to make it better, how to ensure that it's readable from everybody in industry down to everybody at the unit, that it's not going to be misread and trying to make sure that when we define the categories that they are easily readable. Um, which we actually did that as uh, an exercise, we sent out a uh, request to the liaison engineers. We're liaison engineers we have embedded with INS all over the world about um, added manufacturing items. What do you guys want to make? What's going on out there? You know? And they came back and they categorized stuff and they were able to categorize everything so far appropriately. Um, so that's always good. You know, we're, we're constantly making sure that it's readable from the top to the bottom. Uh, we expanded the category because it made sense at the time where we were in the iteration that, hey, maybe we need to break out the seventh category to make it a little bit more clear for the things that aren't going to fly and aren't going to be a tool or a dig or necessarily interface with the CSI for, um, in a way that we would be uncomfortable. Um, the, uh, the chart that you see here, the shopping list, the shopping list has changed completely from the original one. It's gotten better defined, it's more clear, and the P's represent possibilities. It's not a definition, it's not definitive. It's gonna be dependent on that Famiga and how it reacts and what the consequence of failure is. So it's a big team, we're constantly working, we're constantly trying to increase the readability and the usefulness of the, the policy. Everybody is involved. Um, as I said multiple times, from AMCOM to EO to us at uh, Airworthiness, we have a whole lab of folks at AVMIC that are helping us with coming up with ideas and methods for getting stuff approved. It's it's really, really interesting to see this thing come to life from where it started at. So we're expanding it as needed, we're retracting it where it's needed, we're redefining things as needed. So like I said, we're we published revision one, I think, in March, I believe, is when it got signed. Um, and now we're already working on the next revision, and I think we're planning on getting the next revision out maybe at the end of this year. So Major General here was absolutely not kidding when he said, I want to keep this thing alive and updated to make sure that we do the best for our soldiers and for our aviation enterprise as we can. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So that is it. That is all I have for you. Um, you know, it's it's a lot and it's awesome and it's going to serve a very huge function for us in aviation and allow our soldiers to be able to complete their missions quicker. It's going to allow us to make uh, replacements in the field for certain items that, I mean, think about switches and knobs and top hats, all the little things that break all the time that we will now be able to just print one out in the field once we get our processes and everything set in well stone. So it's gonna be really, really great. And I'm really glad to uh, have had your time today. So I will open up the floor to Mr. Martin and any questions you all may have. All right, so I'm trying to turn on my camera. Uh, here I am again. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, you should be able to enter them into the questions box or uh, into the chat and I will bring them to uh, Mark's attention. Um, if it's possible, Chris, can you bring up like the second to the last slide, the slide right for the questions? Because I think that one may generate some good questions as well. Certainly. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to go through our questions that we have. Um, and so the first question was from uh, uh, Channel Flores, and he's asking, are you also considering advanced materials? Hmm. <laughs> well, I would have to say eventually yes, but right now it's very much a crawl, walk, run, right? So some of the things we're looking at are, are very simple. So. To give you guys a better idea and feel for how we're tagging this, um, the 3D printer that's going to be available to most people is called a Lulzbot Paz 6 in our units. It's a nylon printer, so it is a, a plastic printer, right? We are looking at doing some metallics. Um, now, as far as advanced materials goes, it will be out of our 
right? It's not going to be anything quick. We want to we want to try and use things that we have available data for, or things that we can easily generate data for that will be comparative to other materials that we have things available for. So, like um, metallic powders, right? So can I generate some allowables for a simple aluminum metallic powder and get it qualified? And so, yeah, we probably will, that, that's, we can do, and we probably will look at advanced materials, but it would probably be down the road a ways. Okay. Uh, next question I have, is the policy publicly available or is it an internal army document? And that's from Dave O'Brien. I believe it should be publicly available because they ship this thing to everybody. Believe it, because the intent was for industry to be able to utilize this to assist them in their efforts. Um, GE is very heavily into added manufacturing, advanced manufacturing. They have the nozzles that I can't remember what jet engine it's on, but they've uh, constructed a plethora of uh, printed nozzles that are out flying right now. So the intent for this policy was to present it to industry and to partners to give them a roadmap to provide us the material and information we need to qualify or approve it for flight. So it should be readily available to everybody. Do you know where they posted it publicly? That's I, something unfortunately, we I do not. And send to the uh, attendees i do not um i will do this i will double check i will take a task upon myself to double check and make sure that's publicly releasable and if so mr martin i will hand it over to you and make sure that uh we get it out to everybody on the on the call here today all right great <clears throat> do you have any examples of parts that are currently approved that's a question from john barry yes we do have parts that we've flown as a matter of fact, on the AH6I, um, one of the parts that came in while I was actually tech lead over there is the ring on the control boot cover on top of the broom closet. Uh, very simple, it's just a, the uh, thing about the old accordion um, control rod boots, it's just a ring that sits over that and attaches to the aircraft. Um, you know, it's uh, made out of nylon. It is, uh, it's not produced by the Army, it's actually a Boeing part that we approved and is flying on the Saudi Arabia uh, Ministry of the National Guards, HSI currently been flying for about two years now, I think. Um, we also have a lot of tools that we've approved for use. Um, one of my favorite tools, which I don't think I've put in this presentation, the uh, Apache uh, strap pack. When you go to do pull the main rotor blade off and you're doing some maintenance on the Apache main rotor head, <clears throat> we used to use <laughs> styrofoam and zip ties to hold everything in place and so the guys in korea actually create a very nice um, 3d printed nylon plate that they set in there and holds everything up very nicely um, those two parts that i showed you in the presentation that ducted fan cover and that seal were both approved for flight uh, mecs came from ccad to get that on wing uh, and like, as I said, I don't think that the seal on the tail rotor gear ever made it on wing, but the ducted fan cover did. So that's actually out there flying right now. We have a lot of things that are in the pipe right now that we're working on. Um, you know, we have actually our Pathfinder part that we're trying to figure out how to do it. Uh, and if I may take a few more times, a few more minutes of your time, um, the cool thing about this, I can't believe I forgot to mention this. <clears throat> There's a rapid response database that the intent is that these 3D printed components will go in this database once they're approved by airworthiness and they get, you know, the aviation enterprise stakeholders, AMCOM, the PMs bought off on it. And let's say that that fan shroud cover, these guys, when they need one, they'll be able to just go to a database, pull down the model file that they need and print it on that Walls bot TASIC or any other 3D printer. We're, um, right now we're providing them uh, two different files be able to utilize. One is made specifically for that Lowell's Bot Task 6, essentially as a press go soldier. I know nothing else. I know that there's this database and I need this part and it's in here so I can print it because I have this printer. And then the other option are for those who are a little bit more advanced because the Army is looking at doing some training on this stuff down at Rutgers. But 
it's going to be for the guys who understand how a slice file works, which tells you how your build path goes for your advanced manufacturing. And so it's going to be a file that's kind of like a neutral file for that. So it's going to be really cool. Right now that database is actually called Raptor. Um, Adapt, uh, Rapid Advanced Prototype, I can't remember the full acronym, but it's a Rock Island. So it's, you can Google it, Raptor, Rock Island, um, Advanced Manufacturing, There'll, tons of articles out there from the TACOM guys. So that's actually the intent long term is to have that database available for the units worldwide, which is awesome. So sorry, didn't mean to take too much time. Ed, next question. Uh, so next question uh, from Kit Fry. Um, uh, she thanks you for your brief. Uh, and then she asks, have you seen any yeah. progress on developing material properties for metals AM? And uh -huh. is AVMIC investing in uh, MMPDS data uh, for ADA, for AM? So, it's a very good question. We actually have our Pathfinder part for that coming along as well. So, um, we have our initial Pathfinder part, which is going to be a nylon component, nylon based component, which is very simple. Um, it's uh, no airworthiness impacts. It's very easy. Right now, we're just trying to find out, um, and, and it's just a, it's a little radio bezel. It's nothing. It's very significant in what it's doing for us because it's providing us that method to coordinate with the PMs and get their information that we need to be able to get it into this database, the rapid database. Uh, the second Pathfinder part is our metallic part that we're working on right now, which is a link. Um, no, cat no catastrophic failure if it fails. Nothing drastically bad happens, but as part of that effort, what we're doing is we're trying to crawl, walk, run. Um, what are the minimum data that we need to get it on wing, right? So we know it's not a catastrophic failure, so we don't need A basis or B base levels. But what do we need? Then there's the long-term goal of, okay, now that I've got it on wing, what can I get out of this? Is this a powder base? It's a laser powder bed fusion. Is this a powder that we can utilize on more than just this one component? Is it the 7075 of powder, something that we can use for a plethora of different things to be able to uh, fill a void or fill a gap in the logistics chain? And that's one of the things we're looking at at the second Pathfinder part is developing those properties and trying to figure out how are we going to do it? What do we need to do? Um, what are we going to be looking for? So, you know, um, we have a, a very significant team looking into that right now. Um, Dr. Kane, our materials brand chief, who's our SRD airworthiness lead for advanced manufacturing, is heavily involved with that. So it's it's going to be really awesome um, once we get there. So again, it's we are getting there, but it's a crawl, walk, or hunt, right? And hopefully, this will be a, a jack of all trades, metallic based powder. Is the okay. Uh, next question is from Bill Bielman. Uh, he asks, uh, it seems like there's still a lot of discretion involved with the use of the policy. Are you moving towards a more quantitative system to, to minimize some variation? Yes. Uh, so when you go into the back of the policy for the lower category stuff, we have a very defined um, flow chart, how things get from, from A to B for our units and the insertion at our LEs. Uh, the aviation enterprise as a whole are going to follow their general path. As we go along this path and as we learn, the intent is to take this chart here, which is um, all open, right? So this chart's very significant from that for the conversation. We don't know what's going to be required for what, strictly dependent on a category, right? But as we go along, the anticipation is those higher end categories, your CSIs and your safety impacts, those are going to start becoming a little bit more defined. So it'll follow more of a traditional um, qualification path once we learn it, right? Once we figure out, okay, well, I truly do need an A basis for this one, and this is what we need to do to get that A basis. I need this many um, tensile bar coupons from this many different machines. Um, and that's uh, that's the intent, you know, in the long term, because this really is a, a it's a composite of a composite qualification effort, right? 
So you have your traditional methods where you just went and you went to Middle Handbook 5 or MMPDS and you pull your material out of this. You go to advanced composites, carbon composites, you know, I have a whole frozen process plan that has to go into it in order for me to be able to develop the appropriate allowables to be able to say that, yes, this is what it does. And so this is kind of a mixture of both where I have to develop the allowables, but I also have to have that oversight from a process control standpoint. And then it's almost even more difficult than with a, a carbon composite because now it's the what is the intermach intermachine variability between a you know identical machines in two different locations? What's the variability of the machine? What's the uh, the requirements for ensuring that power is lost or ensuring that um, I have the correct environment? Or that you know what what are all those things? Those are things we do not know as of right now. We're learning as we go along. But it will probably be a lot like that. Uh, you know, one of the things that I like to talk about is like a casting. And so all the data right now says that if I do a laser powder bed fusion component versus a cast component, that my laser powder bed fusion has less porosity than the cast component. But do I need to start doing a, a powder bed fusion factor to try and compensate for any of the unknown variables like we do with a cast? Those are all conversations we have right now to try and figure out what that long-term approval square will look like for the CSIs or for, you know, the tier five, the category five stuff. Uh, you know, and, and a lot of this is we are playing policies. There's a lot of army overarching policy. You know, the, um, there's an executive order 2019-29 that drives us to do advanced manufacturing. So we're also trying to maintain our policy in accordance with those documents. So yeah, long term we want to get there. What it's going to look like, how long it's going to take us, I have no idea. It's very much crawl, walk, run. So we're learning as we go. Okay. Uh, next question uh, comes from Talinda Larson, uh, Utah. Are there policies for carbon-based 3D printing? Ooh. No, this one. <laughs> this one. This one's supposed to be the overarching one that will eventually address everything. Uh, and actually, if you look back to it, when we first started this, this did start off as a very heavily additive manufactured based policy. We were specifically targeting 3D printing. And then when we started talking about it amongst the stakeholder FET and the, the team, we realized that we needed to talk about it from a larger perspective and cover things like you're talking about eventually. Not quite there yet, but the hope is that we will get there and they will be covered in this policy eventually. Again, um, everything everything with the Army takes time and this will not be any different. Okay, um, then uh, here's uh, Mark's contact information. The slide is up. Uh, that's uh, partially in response to uh, a question from uh, Chanel Flores. And so there it is. Um, I don't have any other questions except for my own for you, Mark. And so oh, now, dear Lord. I don't know <laughs> if I'm ready for this. And your performance this, evaluation is fully I feel there. like, is this my performance evaluation? All right, so the cate category. Is the category um, self-selected by the person that is interested in doing the part, or is it a way for them to self-filter on whether they even want to do the part? or is it just an entry point for them to have the discussion with the POCs? So, the intent is that anybody who puts in a part will be able to self-identify the category from the policy. That being said, when it comes into, if you look at the policy, and you'll see that there's a roadmap, and I've talked about the units have the entry point of our liaison engineers that are embedded with them. Uh, the aviation enterprise will enter the normal path they do. The PM will, will enter their advanced manufacturing all, uh, items in the way they would any other component that they're wanting to introduce into the air. So the intent is that that person who wants to do it, that, that soldier or whoever it may be, can identify that part, that category correctly. That would then go to the LE and come to us, and then we would just ensure that it was appropriately categorized, right? Uh, Again, the Fumika will tell the tale. So if I bring in a component, I, you know, initially it's identified as a category three, 
but then we go through the Famica, we start thinking about it. So the, the thing about the Famica is it, it doesn't, the Famica is not a standard I, you know, DIDQ, you know, itemized Famica report of 45 pages or anything like that. It could be something as simple as a few engineers sitting down together and realizing this is not this category because if it fails, it goes in the tail rotor blade, just like we talked about with that antenna mount. This is not a category three. This is definitely needs to be elevated. So there's always that opportunity for airworthiness or the PM or somebody other than us to uh, elevate it. Generally speaking, we would be the ones to elevate if it need to be elevated. We would generally be the ones that would redefine it as appropriate to ensure the airworthiness of the aircraft. So yeah, we want you to be able to do it. We want it to be clearly readable so you can identify it, but we will confirm your categorization or modify that categorization as appropriate based on our own engineering judgment and the FAMICA that we do. All right, thank you. Um, yes. Next question I got for you. Um, so how can any interested party in the aviation enterprise participate in the workshop next month? Good question. And that's very, uh, I would direct them to Ms. Lisa Hirschler, who is the uh, Major General Royer as um, um, Dean part of this. So she would be the one you would contact to get the invite to that workshop. So could our attendees, uh, they have your contact information, uh, uh, send you a note and you could get them the correct? I can, I can get them now. I don't know what Major General Royer's um, <clears throat> plan is for this particular workshop. I don't know if he's going to keep the attendee list down, this particular one. I have no idea. I'm not in his brain. So I would be happy to pass along that information to Miss Lisa Hirschler, or if you contact me, I will send out an email to Miss Lisa today and see what her thoughts. Okay, and then the last thing you were talking about uh, the parts database, right? Uh, they at some point in the distant future um, depends on who, how distant. Um, uh, so they want to print that data, uh, that uh, part out of the database. How do they qualify their machine to be able to print that part? Is that ah. the policy, or is that also something oh. with Airways Authority? We are covering that. We are covering that in as part of the uh, TDP that we provide you. So um, in the database, the, the database that's live right now is called Raptor. It is live. Um, the uh, ground-based units have some parts in there that they've been utilizing. They can go in there, they get access to it. It's controlled access, so it's not as simple as anybody can print it. So you have to request access and it goes through supervisors to ensure that you have the appropriate need to actually be able to access the database. There's a lot that goes into it, which was one of our concerns from the airworthiness perspective to make sure that, you know, not everybody can go in there and print stuff or modify the models that are in there. But when what we're putting in there right now, the intent is that you're going to have a technical data. Part of the technical data package, you're going to have your drawing. On your drawing, you're going to have those machine requirements or environmental requirements. As I stated before, you know, we're we're providing one model bot, one model file that's a punch go for the Lowell's bot TAS set, right? Um, right now, we're talking about a category three, yes, it flies. Our Pathfinder part, yes, it flies, but there's no catastrophic failure. There's no, if it breaks, it's already breaking, as a matter of fact, in the field, it's already breaking. This is just a way for us to put another one on there to assist them. So, the machine variability and it you know it's not going to be as imperative as it will and when we move up categories but on that tdp for the other the neutral files we're providing all those uh machine requirements and environment environmental requirements we would want for that as well now keep in mind like i said as i go to a metallic those generally are going to be printed at the unit those are probably going to be at a a uh, uh AVM or AVM, an intermediary unit maintenance unit, you know, someplace that's not out at the unit or operators. So those probably will have differing requirements for the particular machines, but they'll also be able to be controlled a little bit better because it's not out there all the way on its own with, with just a couple of uh, brigades of aircraft or wherever it may be, like these 3D printers can be. So yes, we're controlling it the best we can for right now for the nylon printed stuff. And the intent is as we go up to the metallics and the more uh, 
uh, more highly scrutinized flying equipment components and parts that are going to be on the wing, we will probably adjust that to make it a little bit more tighter. Again, we we don't really know what we don't know what we don't know, and we don't really know what we want as far as you know what that what that machine variability is going to look like. You know, is there even is it even really relevant? You just add a casting unit or a water based fusion factor to account for it. Who knows? We, we're still trying to figure it out as we go. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, yeah. I have not received any further questions, uh, so we, uh, I think we'll conclude. And I want to thank you again for yeah. presenting this information for us. It's uh, very inform uh, uh, informational for us, uh, very informative. I think uh, our audience uh, got a lot out of this, and I appreciate that. Uh, happy so to help. If you have any follow up questions, please contact me. I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. It's really interesting stuff, and I'll, I'm very excited to be part of this. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank uh, you. And then, um, Colton, would you like to come online and uh, talk about the uh, uh, event coming up in June a little bit further? Absolutely. Can we do a quick mic check? Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Awesome. All right. Well, I apologize for my tardiness. My name is Colton Marsha, so I am the uh, VFS Arizona Program Director. Um, and as uh, Ed was just alluding to, we are looking at our next virtual event, which will be held in June. And we are uh, tentatively scheduling uh, Susan Gorton from NASA Ames for July, I believe that's 17th. And I will double check that. We do plan on soliciting the information to everybody, so I will send out more um, but uh, for those of uh, you who are not familiar with Susan Gorton, she is the uh, project manager for the NASA Revolutionary Vertical Lift Technology Project. And her presentation title is going to be the NASA Aeronautics Contributions to the Ingenuity Mars Helicopter. Um, she's been with NASA for about 22 years and uh, we're, we're pretty excited for this one. So uh, certainly be on the lookout. We plan to solicit information starting May 1st and uh, we will of course allow everybody to distribute to their teams, their coworkers, and anyone else that they believe would be interested. So uh, if you guys have any questions um, as we start sending that information out, please feel free to contact me and I will pass along what I know. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Colton. Um, anything beyond that that you know of? As far as our chapter, we will be supporting uh, the upcoming forum um, in the month of May, which is why we don't have anything set up yet. And I believe the Philadelphia chapter is also doing the same thing. So uh, beyond our presentation that we are hoping to hold in June, um, no, at this time, I do not believe we have any further updates. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And so uh, I'd like to, Thank all of our attendees uh, for uh, uh, joining us today. I uh, hope you got plenty out of it. And uh, that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you very much.